My name is Stacy Longwell Sadowski, and this is January 15, 2023, and we're doing an oral history interview for the National Park Service and also Preserve Historic Sleeping Bear, Leland Historical Society, and Two Weeks in a Hammock. Today we are talking with Kevin Mark, who is a longtime North Manitou Island resident vacation summer resident, and he's going to tell us about his experiences. We are in uh, Livonia, Michigan at his home. And Kevin, I wanna start, I'm just gonna ask you a few questions, and as we go, I will let you just answer them, and I'll only add to it when I wanna give you a prompt or suggest a, an additional topic. Yeah. Okay, so um, could you begin by talking about how you came to the island, for the first time, your family experiences, and what years, what age you were then? Um, I remember my dad had a business associate who had been to the island and told my dad about it. And the associate didn't like it because it, to him was too rustic, but it, it appealed to my mom and dad. And I was told it was an island. And the big thing for my dad was it was one telephone. And so I had this vision for those that recall the TV show Gilligan's Island, that it was like that. It would be this island with a telephone pole and a phone on it down at the beach. So I was very excited as a kid, and I was about five years old, would have been, you know, four and a half, five and a half, somewhere there, when we first went. And on the, when we got to the uh, town of Leland where we take the boat over, um, it was about a two hour boat ride on the, the Manitou Island Transit, I think, or the name of that, or the Manitou Isle was the name of that boat. And it was about a two hour ride and my dad uh, met, besides uh, George Grosvenor, the owner of the boat, he met Merle Day, who was the operation, the island operation manager of the Great Lakes Hardwood Company lumbering operation and he had a small operation on the island. Anyway, they got to be good friends and by the time we landed, um, Merle had asked my parents, if, you know, if it would be okay if I spent the night, my first night on the island, um, up at the lumber camp, which is the new hall of a cottage, I believe they we called, we always called it the lumber camp back then. This would have been around 1964. And it was just so much high adventure uh, for a, a small town kid to go up and so I slept on the couch and there were, um, they got up early in the morning for uh, amazing breakfast cooked on this wood stove that they had a, a chef up there, or a cook I guess you'd call him, and these big burly uh, lumbermen that would come in from the bunkhouse. And I just would just, was in awe watching this spread of food. and So that was my first big memory is that first day on the island and at the lumber camp that first night. You know, I would never let my kids do that today. but. My parents were, hey, this this is okay to do, and it was. It was just an amazing experience. And then subsequent trips to the island, each year when we'd come up, we would get invited up to have breakfast and go out um, and spend a day with the lumbermen and see how they did their operations. So. <clears throat> and so when you came there, um, what, how long would you spend each summer when you were there, and until what age did your family vacation there? We started out with just a week to experiment and see what it was like, and we obviously all loved it. I don't know if, if it was the very next year that we went to two weeks, but it was very soon, because we went every year for 14 years, 15 years, roughly, um, up until you could no longer go when there was the, you know, the transition. Um, and it was probably two weeks by the second year, or definitely the third. Very shortly we went to three weeks, and it was almost always in August. This was my dad's profession. That was a very good time for him to take off work. And the second half of those 14 years easily, it was the whole month of August we would be up there. And it was great because we could have a friend up, but we could my mom would invite her siblings and their families up. For a separate week, sometimes they'd get their own cottage. We could introduce them to elements of the island. There were weeks where it would just be myself up there, you know, with my parents, but nobody 
and I could easily be entertained and you know likewise with my parents that so we each had our own thing we like to do but we would talk about the island all year in the off time and preparing and thinking what we were going to take this time things like that <clears throat> so at this time <clears throat> this was before the National Park Service had had um, taken over the island so this was up into and well into the 70s because that didn't occur until um, 1980-ish so you were able to see the last of the vacation era before the Park Service took over and um, what what all what all operations were occurring on the island at the time so you've mentioned the logging and you were there as part of regular summer vacationers what kind of people did you see on the island and interact with um it would vary there would be uh, different uh, small family units that would come up and they wouldn't come back what they did it would be a different month there were some that would come the same time we did both people there were at the time we were there there were three private cottage owners and three cottages that the North Manitou Association would rent out. And some people would rent those other two the same week or weeks that we would be up there. Um, sometimes too there would be uh, one of the, the Manitou Island Association trustees and their family that would be in a cottage and we'd get to know them. We also got to know that gentleman I mentioned before, Merle Day, and sometimes his wife would come over. Uh, we would, you know, have meals with them. Uh, the association, the managers, um, Marvin and Arlene Flewelling, we would interact with them obviously every year, except the one year that they they were not up there, um, contract or some, you know, short short term, uh, where they were gone for uh, till they settled matters. Um, then we got in, I think it was around '67. 1967 that um, we met Rita Rusco and her husband Ken and they had she had purchased property back in the 40s when she worked up there 50s I think it was 40s hoping to come back someday and, and build a, a retirement or a summer cottage and they were just starting it so they would be up there probably most of the summer but every August when we were up there I would always get on my bicycle and was probably about a mile uh, or so away I would ride down and check on their progress and they would love to have me come and Rita was a fantastic host and a good cook and she would always offer me cookies or things and uh, Ken would be more than happy to show me his progress on the house um, then there was also frequently up there because it would be mostly summer um, Clark Fisk and his wife um, Kate Fisk and we would interact with them and get that was a highlight too. Getting to ride in his 1929, um, it was a Model A Ford. Uh, started out as a hard top, but it became a, a convertible pickup truck when a branch, Clark said, took the, the roof off one time, uh, that he was driving a little too fast or it went under something too low. But um, And then the there were several families that owned what is now the Wasserman Cottage. Uh, at the time it was I could say their names, the last name mm -hmm. Alfred and Hollisters. We mainly interacted with the Alfreds because they their time would coincide with ours. Um, and so we all got to know each other and we would do these island get togethers um, at least one, maybe two uh, times during our tour. Somebody would host it at their house. And if you played an instrument, you would bring it down and you'd have snacks and hors d'oeuvres out. And, Lots of great stories about the history of the island. Um, great music and you know the beverages would get flowing and um, just really good. My mom would play her accordion. She had whatever that, it's a, a modern style flute. Um, Clark Fisk would play the guitar and Merle Day would play the harmonica. But I have to say the name that he made me memorize. He said it's really called a Tudor Little Otter Cossin. I don't know if that's accurate. If he was pulling my leg, he was definitely a prankster. Um, but the other thing that I, I feel like I'm taking an aside here, but it was like living history for me to go there because the Hollisters, not the Alfreds, but on the times when the Hollisters would be simultaneously up there, they had, I'm pretty sure it was a 1927 
Ford Model T. I could be wrong, but it's close to that era, a convertible top, and they would drive around and uh, you would see that and hear it, and to hear it was just music to my ears. Uncle Clark's truck that I mentioned earlier, and we would get to ride in the back of that. Um, the lumbering trucks that were old, because I'm a bit of a car buff, there would be these old vintage International Harvester and uh, marquees that are no longer made, and they were no longer legal on the mainland because all the headlights and glass is broken out of them and floorboards are gone, but they were still serviceable. And I would get to see and hear those rumbling, you know, through the, the village area uh, several times a day. And just the equipment, too, that they used on the island. The vehicles that were in some of these still stored in the uh, vacant buildings, old homesteads that were on the island. And for me to be able to go up and then go to the lumber camp and have this amazing breakfast on a wood stove and I would watch the cook. He would spit on it, and he would tell me if it spit danced the right way, he knew it was the right temperature to cook. And they would have, there'd be a stack of pancakes, there'd be pie, this is all at one breakfast. Two kinds of, of meat, um, there'd be homemade donuts. Um, just amazing amount of calories, because these guys really worked physically hard. And they were using tools that a lot of the lumbering had uh, advanced beyond, but that's what they did on the island. And so as a kid, it was like, I'm living, I get to see what it was like to hear and ride and see them work on it and go out in the woods with these uh, lumbering, uh, the, the lumbering operation and see them using some of these older tools and technologies. And I got to ride in those trucks too, coming back. Um, I can remember one, it was had to be from the 30s, it was an old V cab. The fenders were long, long gone, the glass is all out of it. Um, George was from Peshawby town um, outside of, in the Leelanau Peninsula. He was the, he didn't talk much, and he was the driver of that particular truck. And I just remember he just grunted, you know, watch out for the floor. And I, I stepped up and opened the door and the whole seat is covered in mud because there's no fenders, the glass is gone. The whole back of the cab behind my head is covered in mud and there's no floor. I can see right down to the mud because the wood floor is rotted out. So I had to kind of prop my foot off to the side. And it just was an amazing adventure coming down. And these individuals, another cool story about, I get off track and I apologize, but it was with um, George. He had tremendous arm strength. You could just see these bulging muscles. Well, my mom liked to paint, one, oil paint when uh, she was up there. And one time she got some oil paint in the, the uh, threads of her um, easel and she asked me to run up and see if George could break it loose and I took it up there and George proceeds to twist it's not coming unscrewed he's twisting the piping with his bare hands it was amazing to me to see this and then I learned later Merle would tell me yeah he was kind of our our secret weapon we would go around arm wrestling competitions in the different bars in the backwoods up here and George was our secret weapon and they would talk about some of the experts. I can't remember them all and some of the language you know I wouldn't have wanted to repeat but would have been some great stories there too but it, it was just those kinds of opportunities that I just feel very grateful that I was able to have I know I went off track on the question but to be able to have except like living history you know the, the Dearborn Henry Ford Museum is amazing but this was taking it way further, that kind of experience. That's great. <clears throat> and feel free to go off track. Okay. Go with it. If a story okay. comes to your mind, tell it. Um, <clears throat> tell me a little bit about more about Marv and Arlene, the, the caretakers, um, and what their role was, what their personalities were like, any experiences you had with them that you remember in particular. Okay, they were an interesting couple. Um, very, they seemed kind of diverse. But Marvin handled a lot of the maintenance issues, which I really respect because my dad didn't know how to use a screwdriver, but Marv knew how to do almost anything and repair anything. Um, and he was just this shorter, stocky guy. And not, I have to say, he always had a, it was rarely a live cigar. It was almost always a dead cigar butt about two inches in his mouth. And he'd always talk out of the side of his mouth like that. So sometimes it was a little hard to even understand him. But because he knew I would have a lot of friends up, um, he 
he was good on the times when I didn't have a friend up, if I wanted to go join him to do something, he might come up and, hey, we've got an airplane coming, and it's 10 o'clock tonight, I gotta clear the runway, you wanna run out with me? So we jump in the Jeep, we go out, and he would floor it up and down the runway at night, this grass field, there'd be 50, 60 deer out there. And I'd swear, I'd be like, we're gonna hit it, we're gonna hit it. And he'd be, no, they'll, they'll move. And at the last minute, that deer would jump, and that deer would jump. And man, I couldn't sleep the rest of the night. I was just seeing, you know, we're hitting deer all night. Um, another time, you know, he came up, because he did have to enforce the rules of the association, and they were extremely afraid of fires or something happening in Allen. They had no way to put it out. And that was the big part of their livelihood, because of the hunting that they had revenues from, the logging that they had revenues from. So sometime, you know, I was a bigger guy, um, as a teenager, I was wearing size 12 shoes when I was 11 years old, and I was six foot since fourth, fifth grade. So he would like to have me along to look like backup when he had to do a little enforcement. But one of my favorite times was when we got to drive. Um, he and his wife, Arlene, they both had Suzuki RV90s, which will date myself. Those are older bikes, no longer made, but they were made for terrain like that. They had tires that were probably 10 inches wide at least, the big flotation tires, shocks front and rear, but his wife didn't like to ride hers as much. So he knew I could ride one. Um, and he'd come, you know, get Arlene's bike, we're gonna go up, there's some you know, crew up there past Molesky's. And, um, he'd have his, I mean, he looked like a military officer almost. He'd have his pistol on, I'm not a gun guy, but it was a, looked like a big caliber on his open holster and he'd have a big hunting knife on this side, his official cap, and. We go up there, and I usually just kind of stayed back. So I was a teenager, or, you know, early teens. I don't know, gunfire gonna break out, or you know, it never did. But you know, as a kid, you think things like that. Um, and he would get them to go. And um, another time, he he came up. Um, the guy said, "Hey, Cub, you know, I know you don't. Nobody's up here. You know, you might be bored. I gotta fly to Traverse to pick up a freezer repairman. You want to go along?" I was like, "Sure." And you know my parents were always cool about it, so we go and we take off and we just get above the tree line. And he decided he had a sense of humor that I didn't always agree with, but he immediately banked the airplane so the wingtip is just above the trees. And he's just going around. He's just with that you know cig dead cigar and he's talking. What do you think of this? And I said, Well, I think you're going to see my breakfast if you don't straighten this out. And so then he did bring it around, and we went out down over the schoolhouse area and. Um, on over and um, we picked up the repairman and came back and I didn't go back with him but there were just fun opportunities like that with him and he was also good um, I could go down and um, help work on something or when we would rent a Jeep you know we could clean it out in advance and there were uh, a few years we were able to bring a moped up because they were part bicycle part you know I don't want to say motorcycle they only had a 49 cc we had them licensed as bicycles but they weren't meant for all the dirt up there, so they'd get clogged up. And Marvin would let me use the tools down at the generator, which is now the um, registration orientation uh, building um, when people come to the island or the campers. But I used to have a generator that ran 24 seven there. But Marvin would help me disassemble this motor. So he was he was just a good, good guy. I think he missed having a son up there is what kind of felt like I filled that void. Um, Arlene, was just this big presence to me. She was, I think, at least my height if not taller. She was probably a foot taller than Marvin. She could do anything. She was just this tough gal you didn't want to mess with. Uh, yet she was very pleasant, professional, but she just had that persona about her. And she could cook amazing meals for big groups of people, and she was really well known for these cinnamon rolls. She could host events. When there were hunters up there and they used to guarantee that you would go home with a deer, her or Marvin would go out, shoot a deer. She was good with a rifle, um, gutting a deer, no problem. And she could hike circles around you. Um, and she was a smoker too, and that used to blow me away. We were teenage boys, we'd go hike down into the potholes. And she'd hike down in there to show us. She showed us Hatches Camp and a bunch of cool places that I probably couldn't find now. I know I could find the potholes, but we couldn't keep up with her hiking out of the potholes, and we would be in awe. We were using the best device we could, which 
we would go down, or at least I would, I would go down into the potholes. We, the dog that we had at, at the time loved to chew deer antlers. What we had discovered at the time, because the population of the deer was so beyond what um, would naturally be supported, they would seek shelters, the way Marvin told me, they would seek shelter in the winter and go into the potholes. And they'd end up dying there. Was, they couldn't get out, they couldn't get food, enough food. It was like a, you've heard of elephant graveyards, this was a deer grave. There were, every couple of feet there'd be a skeleton. And there were antlers all over the place. So I'd fill my backpack up, but we discovered if you get the smaller ones that were curved and fit in your hands, because you had to use all fours to climb out of the potholes, at least we did, and it was just a tunnel tangled mass of trees and you're climbing over and under, but the deer antler would give you some bite. You would dig in as you climbed out. Um, Arlene didn't need that. She rarely would even get on all fours. She had this old style of shoe. I don't know what they were, but they almost had to look like tractor treads on the bottom. And she just like four wheel drive, but just for two. Climb right ahead and we're looking up. So she was an amazing gal, really good at navigating and was always fitter than you were. It didn't matter what age we were, you, you had to hustle to keep up with Arlene. Um, and they both had, oh, they told us about wintertime hobbies and we even still have a couple of Arlene. She would make candles in the wintertime in the basement of the lodge, which is now, we call it the lodge, but now Ranger Station, the former Coast Guard uh, building. She would make candles of all sorts down there and we, um, she would sell them throughout the summer and we still have a few. Um, you still have the scent on them. It's amazing after all these years, which would be like 50 years ago. Um, <clears throat> and Marvin was into, because again he was very mechanical, he would build um, model airplanes, uh, gas powered ones, and he, they were fantastic, you know, recreations. Even in his office, which is that stone building on the main road up from the dockage area, uh, he had a beautiful three foot miniature a wooden Chris craft, like from the 50s or 40s, the model that he had built from scratch. It was just gorgeous. I remember going in there and looking at that. You know, you couldn't touch it, but it was um, just a beautiful boat. Um, that's probably about the. I mean, there could be other memories, but um, but they were both very unique, fun people. They we would invite them up to the you know the gatherings, the the island gatherings. They would occasionally host one down at the lodge. Uh, their hired hands would uh, get invited or we would get to know them over the years. Um, it was just always a lot of fun to come up and they'd fill us in on what, what was happening, what you know, some unique stories that they had with either hunters or other vacationers like us. And we frequently, um, they knew that we liked the Monte Carlo, so we almost always stayed in the Monte Carlo. It had enough bedrooms, and my dad loved the porch. We all loved the porch, but I'm just saying that we liked that cottage. If it, for some, in the early years, we didn't get the you know privilege status or whatever, because um, my dad and Marvin got to be pretty good um, friends when we were up there. Uh, we would end up with I don't know the I can't remember the name right now, the current name, but during my time it was the Wayne Cottage, and we would. Uh, and it was just the cottage north of Aunt Kate and Uncle Clark's house, which again, I don't Which is the Fisk, true, Fisk Trude Cottage. Fisk Trude Cottage, okay. And then it was, it's the Wing um, Foot Cottage. Foot? Foot. Okay. The Foot family built okay. that. Okay. Yes. They, we would be in that, we were in there at least one year, I don't think even two, and I don't believe we ever stayed at the, Lond the Londrigan, as we knew it, that cottage. Um, but we loved, you know, the island up there and, and the experiences there. But we would see Marvin and Arlene. They would come up. They'd bring our groceries. When we'd order groceries, we'd have to go down. Um, twice a week, we could order groceries from the mercantile. But we would leave the list at night, and Arlene would call it in the next early the next morning. Um, and they'd bring it up in these awesome. If it wasn't one of these old flat fender jeeps from the um, early '60s, they had this. From the, I know they made them in the late 40s, but it was probably in the mid 50s Dodge Power Wagon. And being a car guy, I just love to see that truck pull up. Um, so just great memories associated with Marvin and Arlene, but that's probably the uh, extent without digging real deep. Okay, great. Tell me, <clears throat> tell me about family life and your parents. 
What kind of activities did your parents like to do when they came up for their island vacation every year? Um, Mom obviously really enjoyed being able to get out because my dad was not into the outdoors. Um, she liked being able we could rent jeeps, we could hike. She would, for early on, she would take her bicycle and she had big pannier baskets in the back and she would load up all her oil painting equipment and ride out and paint pictures um, of some of these old homesteads on you know, the old schoolhouse. And just in front of the Monte Carlo, the view down to the lodge, she painted a really nice picture of that. Um, she also liked photography and a lot of um, flowers and mushrooms and fungi and things growing on the trees. She fascinated, was fascinated with photographing those. But she enjoyed taking us to different beaches and exploring. She liked driving the Jeep. She was good. She could drive a stick. <clears throat> the early Jeeps had manual transmissions. Um, and we'd just go exploring around. Um, there were times especially uh, again, it's going to date me because of the old TV show, but we'd be down by the cemetery in those sandy plains. And there used to be this TV show that was about some, uh, I don't know, it was a doctor in Africa. It was called Doctari, this TV show. And they were always bombing around over the savannas with these um, international, or these uh, rovers, those, uh, the British vehicle. But we would drive across through those hills and Imagining that we were Doc Tari going on some rescue mission. Um, but anyway, uh, she enjoyed exploring, like I said, that type of thing. Um, she was also a good cook, even though the uh, wasn't the biggest stove or, you know, cooking uh, capabilities up there. She managed to pull off some great meals on the island. And she'd use, when we'd go in uh, late August, there'd always be some wild apple somewhere she could make apple pie with while we were up there, cobbler or... Uh, applesauce even. Um, there weren't, at the time, there were no berries on the island because the deer ate everything. Um, there would, there was no poison ivy, there was no hardly any bushes, there was, it's, it's a totally different world up there now. Um, but my dad, he was big into reading and uh, he enjoyed the downtime to just sit and read all day, take naps when he wanted to, Enjoy his, you know, the adult beverages in the evening, and sometimes Marvin would stop over to chat, or Merle would stop over, and they'd be out on the porch, you know, enjoying each other's company until late into the uh, the evening. But my dad also liked card games. We would play a lot of card games. My cousins or the, their parents would come up. We'd play a lot of poker games. Which, apropos, now that we over the years learned about the the stories about how Monte Carlo got its name. If that was legit, then we at least honored that tradition. But we played a lot of cribbage, um, things like that up there, and we'd eat our meals out on, the, we all liked to eat on the porch. Or the, the vista from the Monte Carlo porch was just beautiful. Um, Dad would go out and he would do some fishing, but it was mainly a mom baited the hook and he could bring his thermos of Manhattans, then he was okay fishing. Um, and where likewise, would you fish? Um, on the, the um, Lake Manitou in the middle of the island. Marvin knew about his spot, but we rarely would go that far. We, we would, he had a homemade power boat that he'd also built. It was awesome. Probably from one of those popular mechanics in the 50s. Um, but he would take us up to the north end. And he called it Sunken Island. But there was this area near the north end that you could just see the... the dead trunks of the trees coming up. And it was deep. And I'm not into fishing, but it would be a great spot for bass fishing. And he would take us up there somehow, or tell us to go up there for bass fishing. Um, he'd tell us to troll on the west side uh, by some of the old rice, wild rice, you know, paddy areas for the rainbow trout that they had planted a year or two before that. They would plant different fish periodically to see what would take and what wouldn't and he'd be very interested in your catch to see what was working what wasn't. Um, Mom would enjoy fishing and would eat and clean the fish you know if they were didn't have any grubs or anything in them. Um, Dad just went for the social outing uh, once in a while especially if he had a couple up that uh, 
one of the men, the couple liked to fish, then again, that'd be an excuse he'd go out to be social. I would do some fishing, but I also had a toy sailboat that I could attach to the end of my fishing pole. I'd just let it drift way out. You know, the boat, the wind would just take it out, but I could always reel it back in, let the wind take it out. And I was fine, or I'd take a book too, a little pocketbook. So mom could get her fishing and yet have somebody with her because she didn't swim and was terrified of the water. Not that I could have ever saved her, but um, that was beside the point. That was, for the two of them, that was probably it. Um, I don't know if you ask myself or just them, but I, myself, I loved, there was never enough time to do everything that I liked to do when I was up there. We were allowed to bring our bicycles, so I had a Schwinn Stingray with a low gear ratio. Not by design, it just came that way, but it was great for the island because of all the hills and sand, it would help you climb. It was a great bike for doing wheelies on the mainland because it was geared low, but it worked great in the sand and the hills on the island. And we would go back, we'd bring our bikes, and I'd have friends and cousins that were like inclined, and we would go out always looking for the biggest hills to race down. And if my mom only knew some of the stuff we did back there, there'd be these washouts. And we would race to get, like one of the favorite ones was on the way back to the lake. Um, the last like mile or so was all downhill. And we would all gather at the top, and we'd just do this collective race. There'd be crashing. You'd hear somebody howling behind you because they just flipped their bike when they hit a washout or they hit a rock or a log. Because you come around a corner and there could be a tree down. And you're, oh, I don't want to lose to Brad. So bam, I jump, you know, try to do a wheelie and jump over it. And I might crash. Now Dave takes the lead. We would look for these hills all over the island. We could find them. So we pushed our bikes up a lot of hills to be able to blast down. And one night, I shouldn't have been, I did this, but the four of us, had, my, a friend of mine and two of my cousins, we were in our you know, early teens. Had all taken bikes back to for a day of fishing um, at the uh, Lake Manitou in the middle of the island. But I got ahead of them. I don't remember why or I, I had for some reason I had to come back early. I don't remember what, a little bit early. So I left ahead of them. Well, as, um, this would have been between the Frank Farm and the airport. That stretch was a bit of a downhill run there. And as I'm coming through, I thought, they're going to be coming through when it's even darker, and we don't have headlights on the bike. I stopped. I apologize, for, for, but I was mischievous somewhat. I put a bunch of big rocks all across and logs across the road intentionally. Again, my mother would have killed me, and we're lucky nobody got killed, but it was so great. I made it down to our cottage, and I got in our hammock out in the front, front yard of the Monte Carlo just waiting. And I could hear the howls from out in the woods as they would, the first one hit the, the barricade, and then the next one hit the barricade, and then the third one hit the barricade. And you could just hear them, luckily it turned to laughter, and just howls of, I just had the best time. And luckily they did not get hurt. We didn't wear helmets back then or anything like that. And when my mom heard what I did, she was not happy, but um, made for a great memory. And... I don't know if the lumbermen, they were at camp. I don't know if they, I'm surprised none of them came out to investigate because I could hear the howls clear down at the Monte Carlo and I was just grinning to myself, yes. Um, but I would do other, I would do hike. My parents would let me go all day. I would pack a lunch and I'd go up to do around the old, you know, through the, the Stormer camps and Valeskis and I'd come down the old grade through the west side, um, work my way back and I'd be back by dinner and they didn't worry about me. I'd take a flashlight and, at pack a lunch. Um, I loved, I had a, at one point I wanted to circumnavigate the entire island. I didn't do it at one time, but I made it a point to hike the beach around the entire island. But there's one stretch that I don't believe I ever finished, and that would have actually been like from the west side crescent area, the old dock, down to Fredericksons. That's the one stretch I never did hike. The worst stretch though was the north end. There were so many at the time, trees washed down into the water. You'd have to go out, and one day it was a stormy day, and it was a bit rocky, you know, loose footing on the, uh, in the water going around these trees, because there was no way you could climb up this almost sheer cliff and these roots that came down. So you had to go out in the water around them, and you're, you know, anything dry that you wanted, you had to hold it up over your head as you walked around it. 
and not slip and fall and you're thinking man we're, nobody would find us in our body if we did have something happen um, sometimes we would you know I didn't do those trips usually solo I would at least have one person with me but this thing is like that and <clears throat> um, I would just roam around trying to see if I could sneak up on while I remember one time and tell the, the flyings warned me don't do that I a fawn came up to me. I was solo bike riding down to the spring and this fawn got wind of a, a Clark candy bar it was a brand peanut butter and chocolate type candy bar there used to be available I don't know if they still are but it could smell it that I had it in my so I dug it out I got the deer to come up probably three feet away and I was so thrilled with that when I got back but you know Marvin and Arlene warned me don't ever do that the mom could come up and you know you don't want to get kicked by mom so you know there's some lessons I learned like that and I I love going down to the spring and there were several other springs that we found that were on and off the map uh, and just that you could get ice cold water anywhere when you're almost anywhere when you're out hiking on the island and the, the, I like to, to explore the old homesteads. They were just amazing. Uh, when I was there, when we would go, like as an example, the first time I went in, and for several years, when we go into the schoolhouse, it was still standing then, and you could walk inside. The uh, teacher's desk was there. All the original desks were still there. And when you'd open the desk, there were the McGuffey readers and, and old other paraphernalia still in the desk. And this was in the early, mid-60s. Again, it's like a museum, but you can go in and touch. It was just amazing. Over the years, some of these items slowly disappeared, um, but it was cool that we were able to see it when it was all there. And the West Side Dock, that big barn, not dock, the, the big barn at Crescent where the, the dock was, uh, was still full of abandoned farm equipment. And there were a lot of horse, different types of horse-drawn buggies like for for going to, to church on Sunday or going into town uh, nice more formal ones to uh, equipment you'd use in the fields um, lots of uh, again I'm not a farmer either but the horse collars hanging on the, the barn walls uh, there was a I can't date it except it was from the mid 20s I could tell by the radiator there was an old car that had been converted into a farm utility type vehicle they, somebody they had, back, back then tires were quite skinny and so they had welded on a second set in the rear to give it dualies to help get through the sand better the fenders must have something happened because they made the fenders front and back in the bed into a pickup truck and the fenders were all on this floorboard were all homemade wood and they had homemade wooden toolbox on each side it would have been an awesome vehicle to be able to restore it but keep it in that authentic era that it had been fabricated by somebody that was pretty skilled for doing it on the island. But just these vehicles like that. And then down at Bernique's, the garage there had this 32 Ford station wagon. For the, it had the first year of the flathead V8, it had a manual transmission, the, the gear shift lever. And as a kid, I could still remember I was driving a car. I was, my mom let me sit behind the wheel and I'd play with that gear shift lever and pretend I'm driving. But it was interesting because obviously the wood had rotted down to a point where they decided it was best just to cut the roof off. So it was basically just from the top of the doors all the way back to the tailgate um, was the vehicle itself and then the fenders and the motor, but it, that had been abandoned there. Um, what was really cool, if I could take it aside, years later, I ended up buying a Woody station wagon myself from the island when I was 17. Uh, Marvin owned it. He was the second owner. He had bought it from a cottage owner, which he told me, didn't tell me the, the name. He just said the guy that owned the Wayne Cottage, I don't know their name, was the one that brought the wagon over. It was a 1953 Ford Country Squire. It was the top of the line model for that year, and it was the last year for the Ford Flathead V8. And he had bought it from them. I had seen it over the years of my youth going down, and I'm, I love station wagons, so when I was 17, I bought that from Marv and brought that over but that's a whole other story but the years later when I was getting a quote to redo the wood on my station wagon I met an individual outside of Traverse City uh, Mike Nichols he had a woodworking shop and he was more than happy to give me a quote and show me around he said oh if you got this car from North Manor you might want to see this car I just finished for a customer 
it was that 1932 Ford from Bernique's, fully restored. He had just finished it. I started crying. It just, it blew me away from having sat in that car as a derelict in this old barn on North Manitou, this old garage, excuse me, that someone then bought it when the association hauled all these old relics when they were in the process of the, you know, the condemnation proceedings and when they sold out to the um, Park Service. Uh, I'm not sure the, pro the full proper name, but the Island Association wanted to get as much profit out of the island at the end as they could. So anything that might have value was hauled off on the lumber barge and was sold on the mainland. I was told in an auction in Leland. Um, and someone bought that wagon and had it restored. And it was just so cool to years later see that very car as an adult fully done. It blew my mind. Um, but likewise, just some of the things you would see, you know, up at the Molesky place. I remember they had a garden that had these poles that were like 16 feet around the fence to keep the deer out. I were, why they went that tall, I don't know, but I just remember interesting homemade tools too that you would find in, in, in all these old homesteads. The old abandoned vehicles at the lumber camps. It was just, again, to a car person, in the, into the history, and you just felt like you were walking in, in time, you know, back in time. So. That's great. Anything else you want to add from your youth before we talk about your camping years? Hmm. I probably, I mean, I can always come up and stray off on more stories, but I've hit a lot of the big ones and a lot of things. I just remember the, the excitement all year long and as throughout the summers, we would start three or four weeks before we would make the trip up, packing and preparing and getting things that we would, because we'd go for a month, so you wanted to make sure you had enough stuff. We still had to do our laundry by hand and things like that, so it's not like you'd take a month's worth of clothing, but you just, whatever you might need, you know, the books you would want and things you can't get. Food, we can always get more from the Merc, but if there's something special. So it was just that excitement. And years later, my mom um, and I would still, you see a certain beautiful day with a certain color blue in the sky, and we always called it an island day because the only place where we would normally see and feel that scent in the air and the, the, the aura of the sky was on the island. And she had the passion that I had for probably uh, even more so for a long time. Because it just, it was a great place to vacation at that point in time, because we could all do our thing. There weren't very many people. As a parent, you could let your child go anywhere um, and not really worry about them. Um, interesting people, fun, those are just some of those, the picnics that we would do too on the, at Fredrickson, that they'd have all these mishmash old tables that they'd pulled out of some of the old homesteads. And they left them there year round. And they'd made a kind of an impromptu little barbecue grill out of, cinder block and a great go red and we'd have these all day island picnics baseball games and another really fun memory of one of those nights uncle clark had driven his 29 ford pickup to the um the island and he had given the kids a ride and again this is what was fun about it is that we had to take a more circuitous route to get there because it could only make it up certain hills and go down certain hills and even those hills, we always had to bail out, set the cooler out or anything else out. Uncle Clark could back up, get a run, get up the hill. Then we'd lug everything up the hill, get back in, just like they would have had to do in the day because it was an original powered, you know, the original engine uh, from Ford in that truck. But it, when we came back, it was magical. The moon, it was a full, this particular night, there was a full moon out. And we had to take, again, this backwoods way back because he couldn't go up what they call the cat hole on the map, way too steep. Even without people on it, he couldn't make it up. So we had to go clear over to the west side and work our way up and back to, you know. And there we were laying in the back on these flat boat cushions in the back of that old Ford, just looking up at the moon through the tree lights, just going along, listening to the clatter of that old four cylinder engine. I was, this was Nirvana for a car guy and just somebody that liked the woods and the wilderness. I was living in time, and it was, those are the magical moments, a lot of the stuff that I'll always remember, because it was just, where else could you go and live 
for a few weeks of the year or a month with those kind of experiences. So that's probably, I mean, if I sat long enough, I could think of more, but probably a good point to move to a different. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so tell the story of the first time you came as a camper and how that happened. Oh boy, that was an accident actually. Um, so what a friend of mine from um, where I grew up, Owasso, I told him about it and he'd never camped before, let alone backpack, but he wanted to try it. So I thought, well, let's go, because this was at a time, there was approximately five years that the island was closed to the public. So we couldn't go and I had no expectation but my wife and I had gone a couple of times to South Manitou. Again, it wasn't my first choice because I, I love North. It was less, fewer people and more memories there. Nothing against South, it was just my experience. So we get up to Leland and I had an old 68 Buick, um, big seats in it, as, luckily as it turned out because we had to sleep in it that night. But we got up to Leland and George Grosvenor said, the weather's too bad, we, we can't go to either island. But he said, I've got about 20 hunters on north that are stranded. And this was in the fall. It was either late September, probably early October, actually. Um, he said, if you want to go to north, I can take you to north tomorrow. But he said, I'm not going to south tomorrow. I'm only going because the weather's supposed to be a mild break. It's not going to be beautiful, but a mild break enough tomorrow. These guys got to come off. Um, he said, if you want to meet me back here tomorrow at 8, you know, I'll, I'll take you then. So, I thought, oh, we were going to be on south where they had the outhouses and they had the fire rings. And I said, we're going to need something. So we hit the local store, went and bought some toilet paper, and I bought a, a grill just so I'd have a grate that I could use over a fire. That there were no camping stoves or anything available up there, and I didn't have the money even if there were. It was just uh, probably I don't remember what age I was, but early twenties. Anyway, so we went up to that. I don't know, it was Northport, there's some state park at the tip of the peninsula. And we slept the night and it was cold. We'd get up, we'd wake up every couple of hours. And Jerry had the back seat and I had the front seat. We slept there, woke up every couple of hours, turned the car on and warm up. But we made it back there at eight. Interesting boat ride over. We had, we were taking maybe eight or 10 hunters over as well, but we had to go to the Stormer, the old Stormer dock, or the, where it was located. Um, so he could pull a boat fairly close because it was pretty deep up shore and then they cast this heavy duty ladder out the front um, and it didn't reach the, the soil it went into the water but it was only a foot or so deep but there were waves coming in but we did a brigade then all the hunters were down there that were on the island stranded they formed a brigade we did one inside the boat and we passed all our gear off and then passed all their gear in there weren't many deer from my memory. They didn't get a lot of deer that first one, or at least they were, they were on the smaller side. But once they uh, were done and we're collecting ourselves, I recognized one, Ken Rusco was in standing talking to one of the rangers, or there was only one ranger there, but he was talking with him. And I was just thrilled to see Ken. I remembered him from uh, those prior years when we vacationed up there and rented the cottage. So I was, that was great. And Ken invited us to come back to their house um, while we were up that five days, well, six days, whatever it was, to have a, a dinner and reminisce, catch up with his wife, Rita. And then the ranger was, oh, you guys are backpacking? You know, are you camping? Yeah, no, you're not hunting? He said, well, you'll have to come up to the lodge. He said, I'll have to dig off, you know, the form. He said, you're actually will be our first official backpackers on the island. And I thought that was kind of cool. And so the, the next day we hiked up there to the village and we ended up camping by the spring um, up on the ridge, which was just totally clear at the time. Because again, the deer had uh, just like defoliated the whole, anything they could reach. So the woods were totally different then. Um, but it made a nice spot because you could go down in the spring, get your water for cooking and coffee. But we hiked up there and he dug it out and he again stated, you know, this is, this is pretty cool. He said, this is the very first one. Um, I kept that form and the, the tag that we had to keep for years. But one of our moves, it went one way and we went the other. And I got separated from it. But it just was, 
kind of cool because of my memories and my love of that island. It just was a little point of pride for me that inadvertently I was the first official backpacker on the island. Not that I'm any great backpacker experience, but it still meant a lot to me um, with that. And we did end up getting, and I do remember the very first time I came out of the woods from, on that trip on our way to the ranger station at the Katie Shepherd. I actually teared up at that point just because with five years of not being mowed and people there, and you just felt the void of humanity there. These houses had been lived in, not the Katie Shepherd place, but uh, we walked by the Clark's place and it was all boarded, you know, closed up and no vacationers at the wing and the grass was growing up and the lawn. It was such a lonely, the ache and void, and I, I teared up when I saw it. It was just those live, lively, vibrant memories of when, in my youth to now walk into this like abandoned village. And as I went down past, because I didn't go right to the ranch, I went down to the Monte Carlo and I looked at that and just all the memories flooding back. And I was starting to head over to the intersection where the uh, office was, that stone building. And I heard a familiar engine. And I could just feel a swelling of just relief and like flood of good memories coming back. It was Rita and Ken's, their old Dodge. It was the equivalent of the Chevy Blazer. I can't remember what they called it, but it was a um, SUV type vehicle. They called it the Orange Crush, their name for it, this four wheel drive. And it was rumbling with, I'm sure it's mufflers gone, coming down um, the south road behind the Monte Carlo and around the corner. And again, I teared all up. Rita got out, gave her a hug, and it was just, it was like I was just rejuvenated, like I'd been born again. That, that sounds hokey, but it meant that much to me. It was that, I'm tearing up thinking about it. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Oh my gosh. That's absolutely beautiful. I'm sorry. It just, that was a profound, I, I just very well remember that. Because I just walked through this whole stretch of like an abandoned ghost town. And that was painful yeah. enough. Because all these great memories as a kid. And then all of a sudden there's an injection of old life, old old island, and people I knew and it was close with just coming and luck to rescue me. It was a pivotal moment. But anyway, I don't want much of that hopefully. That's wonderful. So since then you came back as a camper several more times. Mm -hmm. Brought your fiance, and your mom. Yeah, that's right. There were. There was the trip with my mom. Uh, there was the trip with each of my sons. It was a, when they were ten. I took them up on a father-son trip. So there were two trips there. My wife Sue and I and her brother went. And then there were two trips after we were married and had the boys where we went as a family, so that would have been by six. Oh, and I forgot about the ones with just a couple of guy trips I did with a buddy of mine from high school. Probably eight or nine times all together we backpacked after that. Um, it probably started out first with a buddy of mine from high school that we went up. Um, had a great time. We kind of had, you know, we were good about, okay, you want to, if we don't want to go to the same spot that day, you go somewhere else. But um, the one trip we again camped at the, above the, on the ridge above the spring, but there was a four day storm up there. It was just, you get out to the beach and it, even the trees above you just roaring all night long. Excuse me, the rain would just be like horizontal. Luckily we brought rain gear, so we still got out. You don't want to just sit in camp all day. We'd get out and hike. It made for great sleeping though, because you just had that roar in the trees. And um, I had a little candle lantern that I would put in one of my shoes, camp shoes, so I could read at night. And the, I had a brownish tent and brown and gold. And it just felt this warm cabin glow, this false sense of security. Because I remember the next morning, a big branch had fallen between our two tents. And yet, 
you know, you feel fine when you're out, if you're out camping, you're always, you know, something could happen. But we ended up hauling the branch over and used it as a windbreak for to help with our cooking breakfast and our, our dinners. We just improvised with it. But Rick and I went a couple of times. And one trip we met a couple of guys, uh, um, they were both brother-in-laws that came up at the same time we did. And we really hit it off with them. They were similar age. And we would, I showed them a lot of places that they didn't know about and we really hit it off. And we then planned another trip um, together, I don't know, it was the very next year. And then there was a time I brought another friend from, um, well, I already told you about that one, the very first time I was up with uh, the friend Jerry who had never been backpacking before. Um, after that, I think Sue, and my wife Sue, and her brother Fred and myself went up, and we camped, and that's when we had an experience, our first experience with uh, uh, Rita's Hospitality. We had plenty of experience with Rita's Hospitality, but her island smash, we, she had invited us down for, again, her one of her famous dinners, and I think that night it was the black bean Cuban, or the Cuban black bean soup, and her cornbread sticks that she would make from scratch and we had to have some cold island smash and this was summertime so a cold beverage ice was great when you're out backpacking but we had thought we would just go down have dinner and come back so we didn't bring flashlights and we were camped down by the spring well we were dipping into that island smash and it goes down like pure lemonade if you've never if somebody's never had it you can catch up with you and it did and what was in the island smash my memory is it was, there was, I don't know the exact ratio, but there was beer, a um, frozen you know, canister of uh, lemonade, and vodka is my memory, mainly vodka. Because um, you didn't taste it, it just tasted like iced lemonade. A little bit of, little bit of tang from the beer, you know, the um, carbonation. And it hit, hit the spot, because again, you're camping. So we all probably imbibed a little too much. And Ken at the time was doing some, a little bit of light road maintenance and he had just graded that road that we had to hike down. And there's a lot of white sand on the island when you're in the woods and at night that would reflect and you could navigate pretty easily on a trail um, at night. Well, it was all black after this and it was a cloudy night. There was no moon now. We had no flashlights. All I had was a pack of matches on me. So. We set out and it starts getting dark as soon as we pass through the Cunningham clearing. We're like, man, we didn't think to bring flashlights. We're all staggering anyway. So we ended up grabbing hands and we just walked down the trail. Yeah, I'm hitting a tree, Move. we gotta go this way, Sue. And she, somebody hit a tree on Fred on that side and we'd come back and we managed to get down to where roughly I thought the deer trail was and went back to the spring and then the trail up to our tent. Well, I knew the place better than them. <clears throat> and I had a small packet of matches. So every now and then I'd light one to see quick. There's the trail. So I'd start on it. Kept them on the main road waiting for me. And I'd light a match, look about 10, 12 feet ahead, kind of trot quick, put the match in the match, I'd blow it out. And I used up my book of matches getting up to camp. Grabbed a flashlight, came back and got them. That was a fun memory on that trip. And then we all wondered why we had hangovers the next day because it hit hard. You just don't realize it. So a word of warning, anybody that ever has an authentic uh, blended or, or uh, put together island smash recipe you gotta be ready for the next day um then there were uh, i'm trying to remember which came first i tripped with the boys but somewhere in there i'm thinking it was before the boys we were married but we hadn't had our kids yet my mom really wanted to go back and she'd always struggled with her weight for years but this turned out to be a really good incentive for her because she knew if she was going to backpack, she would need to get in shape, in better shape, and drop some weight. So she did. Um, unbeknownst to me, even though I kept, I knew my mom, I kept telling her, this, you, we're going to give you a pack, this is all you can take. When we showed up, she's got her pack, she's got a day pack full of stuff, she's got a garbage bag full of stuff. So it was not fun for me because I knew I wanted my mom to have a good experience. So I carried my pack, which I had the tent and all the other gear, and now I'm carrying her heavy day pack, and I'm carrying this garbage bag of who knows what. So, but she was thrilled, and we ended up touring around, and, and she, we did a lot of hiking that she never could have done in the past. Went up to McCumber's Monument, 
um, we went to the west side. Uh, we camped likewise down by the spring. She had her own tent and we had ours. But it was, we marveled at, we found out what was in all this. Whenever you're backpacking, inevitably somebody says, boy, I, I would love a cold Coke or I would love such and such a candy bar or some treat that you can't take. And mom would say, oh, I have some right here. And she'd bring out a can of Coke. And, I'm, and another time we talked about some, you know, she used to make, I would ask her to make some really good fried bread before I'd go. Because it would pack good, it'd last for a few days, it tasted good for whatever meal we'd have it with. Well, she was going to, unbeknownst to me, make stuff on the island. Not fried bread, but... Um, so, one day then we were um, doing, the, on the day we did the, the McCumber hike, she had made the dough up. And being my mom and a good cook, she knew the only way to keep it warm all day while we were hiking was to put it inside her brassiere. And she had a couple of big cups that she wore anyway, so there was room for a third one that she put in there. <laughs> if somebody were to see her though, she had that third one hanging down and that was that ball of dough rising throughout the day because it was the only warm spot to keep it. But we got back to camp and we had those Boy Scout clamped together pans and we divvied it up and we had a little what the camp stove was, was it back then it was a Sierra stove or what, but we slowly baked bread, homemade bread on the, the pans. And then we'd say, oh gosh, this would be so good with some jelly or something. I'd, oh, what flavor do you want? I've got, I mean, she'd bring out these jars, small jars of, of different jelly. And they were just different, I mean, I probably could have asked for ice cream and she would have had it, but anyway, um, we came back then after this, this great trip for her and we spent the last night at the village campground um, nobody else up there but us and we set up camp and to kill a little time there were a lot of green apples on the trees and we found this perfect like bat sized stick so we played baseball with rotten apples or not rotten apples but hard apples they'd smash when you hit them but we had a blast playing in the field up there but then that night because I we'd always so far camped out in the woods and the raccoons weren't a problem but apparently they'd gotten acclimated to people and equated up with food. So we're in our tent and I hear, our, you can't, there were just those old apple trees or cherry trees, so they couldn't get your food real high. But we hung our food up, but I could tell something was getting into it. And so I came out and I'm, you know, trying to yell and scare them away. And 20 minutes later, they'd be back. So I hung our pots and pans so they'd rattle and I'd hear it even sooner about if they were getting the food. I was up a half dozen times that night. The first time I had to chase them clear out onto the runway to get her food bag. They took the whole bag. It was like that old cartoon, you know, Yogi Bear and Boo Boo. There was a big raccoon and a little one. And the big one, Yogi, he'd be pulling the big bag and you know his partner in crime would be running right behind him. But by that point during the night, I went over to one of the trees with a flashlight and I grabbed a bunch of these little hard crab apples. I didn't have a slingshot, you can't, you know, stuff like that, but I wish I had, but I would throw apples at them to, just to get, drive them away. We didn't have any rocks or anything. I didn't want to go up with this. They were almost tame enough to go up with a stick, but they would run from you. All night long, I was trying to save our food bag. And why, I don't know. We only had one more night. But if the weather had turned bad, you know, you don't want to lose all your food just on the assumption that tomorrow's going to be a beautiful day, you'll get back to Leland. So that was the the end of the, with that trip with mom. And then we did a couple of other trips after that with um, our two boys, Ben and Ian. Um, those were fun because they had, um, Ian went before I did the father-son trip when he was 10. Um, I did a similar trip with my oldest Ben when he was 10. We just did a father-son trip. But Ian was younger than that when I know on his first trip and then he was probably maybe 12 the last time we went, and Ben maybe was 14. Um, and we'd take a tent for them and a tent for us, and we would go out. And they were really good, you know, troopers with it too. Ian initially had a little trouble this first time because just the backpack. He would, a couple times he'd fall on it on his back, and he'd just be like a, a beetle or a turtle just sitting there, just unable to get up, and we'd have to go rescue him. But they would be fascinated with all the little like when we went to South too another a time with them as well. The, the little toads that would be all over running around. And, um, one night, 
uh, when I was with Ben on his trip, the first time I ever even knew they had coyotes up there, they started howling. Actually, that was with Ian. And I was worried he would be afraid because all night long, about every 20 minutes, half hour, they would let out, the pack would let out a howl. And they were slowly, it sounded like, coming closer to our camp. Ian fell right asleep. And I'm laying there being the protective dad. I think, well, gosh, I don't know. I've never, you know, at this point, camped around coyotes. And they didn't even know they had them on the island. But finally, about 11 o'clock, I heard them. And they, they were probably coming back towards the spring. We were camped between the spring and the beach on that flat, rolly plain area just inside the trees. Um, we were definitely within, you know, the, or the park's parameters of the 300 feet then, but it was, I didn't want to be quite at the spring, I didn't want to be too close to the water because of the wind and things. Um, but I think they must have gotten a drink at the spring because then about 11.20 I remember hearing the last howl and they were going west, they were way far off in the distance, but I, I remember that distinctly that first night. But each of my sons were into different things. Ben and I had an experience. We were south of that clearing by Bernique's. There was just this big open dune, and we had stopped to have a snack on our day's hike that day. We'd gone to Bernique's, and we're doing a loop around. And back then, a lot of the chipmunks out in the woods just seemed tame. And we st it started out because we had a trail mix, and it had M&Ms in it. And just on a lark, I tried to roll one down the dune, and it would. So we started having M&M races, Ben and I, rolling M&Ms down that sand dune. But a chipmunk came out and, I don't know, we should feed them chip, chocolate, but they sure liked it. Next thing we know, we've got eight or 10, they were just coming out of the woods. It was, we were both like, we're, they we're afraid they're gonna go up our legs. They were just coming all over to, and we were flicking you know, different parts of the nuts too. We weren't giving them just chocolate. I don't know, maybe there was a mass, you know, like a Jim Jones conference, they all died from chocolate, I don't know. But it was just, it made a big memory because we were like, who would have thought out in the woods, wild chipmunks would just throng in like that. It was pretty amazing. That was a cool thing that even, you know, Ben will still remember to this day. And it all started because of M&M races down a sand dune. Um, south of Bernakes in that clearing of theirs. Um, Ian, I don't remember anything quite as high. Like we had a great time too, going around different areas. Um, both my sons, uh, you know, are readers too, and we would have books and we would read um, in the evening. And we had a little pocket hammock that we would take and we could use that. Um, so some good memories with them. And we haven't been back probably. It's probably been at least 15 years since. My wife or I and any of our family have, have been out and I'm looking forward to a, another trip. So plans for the future? We'd probably like to try. We still have our equipment. We'd be the dinosaurs out there with, but um, I think we'd be game, you know, because uh, it's not like traditional backpack where you're, you know, you're going 10, 15, 20 miles a day and setting up camp and real hardcore. You could just go like we usually do three miles in, set up a base camp and do a lot of day hike. And then maybe we'd move somewhere a couple days later and do a base camp. But we were primarily one at most two base camps. And we'd have a small day pack and we'd just pack a lunch and go out for the day. And um, I often thought of going up, but I've never done it yet, but going up solo and just taking a bunch of paper, well, you know, a few books with me and just chilling for a week, finding a good spot, take my pocket hammock and just enjoying the island, its rhythms, nature, you know, like we all enjoy when we're up there. That's great. Okay, any any final words? Hmm. Well, obviously, you know, you, you'd like to, or I like to think of encouraging people that have never been to something like that, um, especially if they're respectful of what the island is. And if you, you do go, you know, to try and learn some of the history and appreciate what the people went through, the early settlers, um, their homesteads to visit those that are remaining and, and the buildings that are being rehabbed and refurbished now and trying to imagine that's what would help and was fun for me to and I was fortunate I was able to, to semi connect even closer with that past because of the era I was there but you can still when you stand there in those those spots and in front of those porches imagine somewhat what 
those vacationers and, and the Islanders would have experienced. And if you read some of the, there's some great books out there. Um, I can think of Rita's book, you know, Sunrise, Sunset. There's others that I cannot think, and I apologize, I can't think of the name right now, but there are other books of different eras on the island. And it just makes it more fascinating when you're up there to see where these events happen and you just feel more connected with it. And I think I would encourage people that do want to go to try and familiarize yourself with the island and what it has to offer and what it offered to prior generations to get that full perspective. It's not just go there, party. I mean, there's plenty of places to do that on the mainland. This, this is, a, there's a unique atmosphere. And Rita always told us too about, you know, the island, the, the spirit of North Manitou and how it would capture you. And you'll know if, if the spirit likes you, you will always feel in your, your heart and soul and you'll be captured for life if it likes you and you'll always be drawn back. And if you give it a chance to enter your psyche, you could be one with that and you'll always have that lifelong connection. And as I've gotten older, I, I see what she means. When I was younger, you know, sure it might sound a little hokey. I loved the place, but I didn't understand it in her terms um, until I came to a better understanding in you know, later times. So wrapping up, that's probably what I would say is it's, it's a very unique, beautiful place. The serenity there, and yet the history all blend together. Um, the, it, it just has a lot to offer and, and try to learn about it before you go. Okay, thank you. That was wonderful. Appreciate that a lot.